Uh, well, so good morning or good afternoon, buenos dias or buenas tardes, bonjour or bon soirée, uh, bon dia or boa tarde. Uh, we would like to start our panel by thanking everyone for joining us today, and especially to the organizers for putting together a fantastic symposium once more and for providing language interpretation this year. Just as a heads up for the audience, uh, we will be presenting in English, Spanish, and French, and you can uh, jump uh, the rooms that you need accordingly. And then uh, before I let my colleagues start, I would like to uh, also thank the uh, our team members who are not here with us today. Uh, this is only a small representation of the team uh, of the project of programming historians. So I would like to thank all of them as well. And uh, Sarah and Brandon, take it away. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, so, uh, and thank you all for being here today. Um, and actually, Jennifer, if we could jump back one slide, I just wanted to give a really brief overview of uh, where we started um, from the programming historian and where we are today. Uh, to give you a little bit of context. Um, so as this timeline indicates, um, the English edition of Programming Historian first launched in 2008, really as an introductory resource to Python, uh, but it expanded its editorial team and focus um, and shifted to becoming a peer review journal in 2012 uh, with an open peer review process. And in fact, many of these early Python lessons still remain some of our most viewed um, lessons today. Uh, in 2016 and 2017, we brought on the programming historian in Espanol team, uh, our Spanish language team. And in 2019 uh, and 2018, we expanded to include a French language team uh, as well as to become a uh, not-for-profit company, which allows us to do things like apply for grants. And um, very excitingly, in 2021, we added our Portuguese language team. So we are now a uh, quad-lingual uh, journal, four languages. Uh, I'm not sure of the, of the exact right prefix there, uh, but we, we publish in four languages and that has been a really exciting uh, development for us. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So Brandon and I are going to speak today about uh, moving from an English, an English language journal to what we're calling a translation ready journal. And we're going to talk a little bit about the social context and also the technical context around that. Um, next slide. Thank you. So open access has been at the heart of programming historians mission from the start, and it's been a crucial part of our success as well. Uh, it's difficult to imagine, for me at least, having the same global reach as a closed access resource. And indeed, the programming historian is global. Um, and as we noted in that introductory timeline, um, the Spanish language team joined in 2016, followed by the French team, and most recently, the uh, Portuguese team. And I wanted to show a snapshot of what our homepage looked like uh, circa 2012. It was, of course, monolingual. Um, and then what it looks like today, which is uh, the screenshot that you see here. And you can see up in the right hand corner, we have um, buttons for uh, English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese, um, as well as many, many more <laughs> lessons than we had uh, back in 2012. Our visitor statistics uh, demonstrate our global reach as well. And next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so in the past 12 months, which is what this slide represents, uh, we've received over 1.5 million visitors. And while most of the visitors have been from the United States, the journal uh, 
Uh, so as you can see from the, uh, from the graph here, while many of our visitors do come from the United States, um, we also have quite a large number of visitors from India, as well as from various countries in Europe and Latin America. And because our content is licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license, we've also had scholars translate and localize our resources in Japan. Um, next slide, please. Uh, which you can see here. This is the homepage of a um, Japanese uh, translation and localization of uh, some of our lessons. Uh, we don't have a dedicated Japanese team, um, but because of that licensing, uh, it, that enables scholars from around the world to take our content and translate it, um, even if we aren't able to institutionally support a team in that language. But being a so-called translation-ready journal also has its challenges. While we strive to ensure that our lessons are easier to translate by doing things like limiting word count and asking authors to choose their case studies and examples with a global audience in mind, we can still find it difficult to see beyond our own contexts. Recently, for example, uh, we received several English language submissions on the topic of named entity recognition. And I happened to casually mention this in a team meeting, uh, and Jennifer correctly noted that uh, named entity recognition is much less reliable in languages other than English. And the inequity embedded in digital humanities tools and resources can make the work of translation even more difficult. So these are some of the social context of translations, and I'm going to turn it over now to Brandon to speak about our technical infrastructure and how it enables a multilingual um, publication. Uh, thanks, Sarah. So if you can go to the next slide, thanks. Uh, so I just wanted to share a few things that we do with the journal's technical infrastructure to maintain the multilingual digital publishing ecosystem that we're discussing today. So each of our journals shares core components. So the general editorial guidelines, submission guidelines, uh, the processes by which we go about conducting peer review, those are all shared among the journals. And each language specific publication all uses the same technical platform for submitting and reviewing work. The public facing pages for each journal are all translated and kept in sync with one another as we try to make changes to our process. Uh, but the translation projects are in various stages of completion, uh, as you saw on the timeline. Uh, certain languages have, for the journal have been working for far longer. Uh, and original lessons might originate in any of these languages, which is very exciting and something that's new. Uh, so we have, that's to say we have core shared elements, but each journal is also acting uh, independently to some degree according to their own timelines for production. These activities take place almost exclusively in a technical platform called Jekyll on a um, coding social media platform called GitHub. Uh, and GitHub collects a suite of tools associated most closely with project software development together. Uh, and it's how we facilitate our work. So this platform has a lot of issues and a lot of problems, which I'm sure others will discuss, uh, Nabil in particular, uh, if not otherwise in the Q&A. So I'm just gonna discuss a few of the reasons that we do use it and some of the things that we do with it uh, to facilitate our work. So GitHub is a platform that helps to manage changes to groups of files uh, on a line by line level being carried out by a uh, group of people. So rather than syncing changes among documents automatically, each part of that process, so saving a change, uh, sending it up to a cloud, retrieving someone else's changes, uh, those each require their own command. In short, the sort of thing that happens automatically in Google Docs when you have multiple people editing a document gets broken out into several different technically complicated processes. So this core idea of shared editing in a slow, deliberate manner is something most of us regularly engage with and can understand. But because GitHub breaks out this editing process into so many pieces and yeah. adds this complicated layer of vocabulary onto each step of the process, uh, So I was saying um, the underlying idea behind GitHub that you have people editing a document together is something a lot of us engage with, but 
uh, GitHub adds this technical layer and a linguistic layer that makes it uh, incredibly confusing for people, um, people who are very intelligent, very capable, very technically proficient, um, but GitHub just causes a lot of problems. That being said, I'll talk about some good aspects of what we can do with it. Um, so if you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so before you is a typical example of what a change to a file looks like in GitHub's interface for viewing them. Uh, so looking at this just briefly, GitHub, GitHub makes it clear what I changed in a file. So changes in red mean a line was subtracted and green means a line was added. So you can see at a glance what was changed without having to do much visual collation on your own and without needing to be super familiar with the documents you're looking at. Uh, and the way we make a change to the shared architecture of the project then is to propose some changes to a shared page, uh, share that with the group, and then work with this interface in GitHub to ensure that everything moves along in a synchronized way. So here you have a single change to our editorial guidelines mapped across French, Spanish, and Portuguese. So we take advantage of this slow, deliberate way of making changes as a way of facilitating the kinds of work that we ask of the people doing the translation work on the site from English into the other languages that we work in. So lessons are translated in whole units, but I mentioned before that we have core architecture for each journal that we want to stay relatively in sync. Uh, this is made complicated because the process by which we do things is constantly evolving. Uh, so Sarah showed the front page and how the front page has changed, but our editorial guidelines and our processes have also changed over the years. And as we change them, we have to translate that workflow. Um, so in the past few years, we have shared new guidelines for how to write sustainably, uh, advice for how to write with an international audience in mind, and numerous changes to our submission process. Each of these changes has text that needs to be translated across the different language editions. And we want to make sure that things are current and not in various stages of completion so that we have sort of a unilateral rollout or a uniform rollout at all times. So we use GitHub system to coordinate our efforts. This also ensures that we're intentional about making changes to these core documents because I think it really helps to make legible for the English team in particular the extraordinary amount of work that goes into this translation process. And I think that's been one of the biggest changes over the years since the initial version of the programming historian, uh, which came out as a WordPress website because I think we're much more intentional in process than we used to be. Ideally, noticing that any change uh, we make has ripple effects across all the different languages we work in and for all the different people who are working on the project. So now we try to think of our work not just in terms of an English speaking audience, but as part of a larger publishing framework in dialogue with the different journal efforts that you'll see on the panel today. So I think we try to think of the work as destined for a multilingual audience and destined for a multilingual publishing. Um, and over the years, we developed a technical infrastructure to help facilitate that process. There's a lot more technical work that I could talk about, a lot more being done in Jekyll behind the scenes to facilitate this translation. Uh, and like I said, there are lots of problems and drawbacks to working with GitHub, but I'll leave it there so that other people can have more time. Thank you, Brandon. Um, now I'm gonna present in Spanish. So I want to get some heads up in there. Um, and I'm going to present about uh, translation is not enough localized resource writing through community building to give you a little bit of background about our Spanish journal. Oops. Puesto que las lecciones de programming historian tienen una licencia CC BY, como ha dicho ya Sara, en principio cualquiera puede copiar y redistribuir el material en cualquier medio o formato, remezclar, transformar y construir a partir del material para cualquier propósito. Esto incluye el permiso para traducir y adaptar nuestras lecciones a cualquier idioma y contexto, pero traducir estas uh, lecciones no es tan fácil como suena. Con las instrucciones no hay problema, pero no todas las lecciones presentan un método que puede usarse para trabajar con materiales culturales o históricos en español, y luego no tenemos el mismo acceso a materiales digitalizados para ofrecer ejemplos que reemplacen a los originales. Presentamos brevemente las dos estrategias adoptadas para mejorar esta situación. En abril de 2016 llegó a oídos del equipo de Programming Historian que las lecciones en inglés estaban siendo utilizadas en Colombia y México y surgió rápidamente la idea de integrar las traducciones al español a la revista en inglés. 
se formó un nuevo equipo editorial y en aproximadamente un año, María José Afanador Yat, Víctor Gayol y Antonio Rojas Castro lanzaron Programming Historian en español tras adaptar la infraestructura y revisar varias traducciones ya existentes, en concreto las lecciones sobre Python. A partir de entonces, se continuó traduciendo material al español con diferentes grados de adaptación o localización de los materiales. Analizando las propias traducciones para entender mejor nuestra tarea, Antonio Rojas Castro y yo hemos identificado tres tipos o niveles de traducción que presento ahora. Tenemos un nivel básico, nivel 1 o lingüístico, en el que se traducen únicamente las instrucciones y el conjunto de datos, las imágenes, el software, quedan en inglés o en el idioma original de la lección eh, traducida. Es el caso, por ejemplo, de contabilizar y minar datos de investigación con UNIX, puesto que se utiliza el mismo conjunto de datos en inglés que contiene términos no cognados o que no son identificables fácilmente en el español, como Southeast, Improving o Gold, uh, Sudeste, Mejorar, Oro. Quien complete la lección sin saber nada de inglés no podrá realmente saber si los resultados más allá de los que muestra la lección son correctos o no. Solo podrá leer las instrucciones. En una traducción intermedia nivel 2 o con cambios expresivos, se traducen las instrucciones y parte del contenido y se añade información adicional, bibliográficas, notas de traducción para la audiencia hispanohablante, pero quedan cosas en inglés. Así, en procesamiento básico de texto en R, yo misma me vi en la tesitura de traducir todo lo posible, pero tener que dejar el corpus textual principal en inglés, por la forma en la que se lleva a cabo el análisis de frecuencia de palabras para producir un resumen de documentos con un listado de palabras más frecuentes en la lengua inglesa. Esta fórmula eh, utiliza un archivo de uh, un millón de palabras o algo así en inglés que se utiliza más, frecuentes, más frecuentemente en inglés, pero no tenemos algo similar en español, por tanto no pude hacer el cambio completamente. En un tercer nivel de localización completa, nivel 3, tenemos las traducciones a nuestro entender más útiles. Son aquellas en las que se cambia o adapta el material que sirve como ejemplo para utilizar el método presentado en la lección, incluyendo las imágenes, el código, el conjunto de datos, el corpus textual, etc. El mejor ejemplo con el que contamos hasta el momento es la lección de introducción a Topic Modeling y Mallet, escrita por Graham Winger uh, Milligan, y traducida y adaptada por Ulrike Henry Kramer. Puesto que Mallet funciona, y que me perdonen los expertos, con bolsas de palabras que en realidad son caracteres separados por espacios y la máquina no sabe en qué idioma están, si no se lo decimos y en realidad la máquina tampoco eh, tiene ese conocimiento, Ulrike decidió reemplazar el corpus textual original que viene uh, con el software Male por un corpus textual de 19 ensayos de José Martí. Con esto se logra en la lección una mayor comprensión por parte del usuario del tutorial, pues podrá entender los resultados que obtiene al practicar para la identificación de temas, de topics, más fácilmente y si no sabe inglés, entenderlos cuando no podría hacerlo con el corpus original, que es lo que puede ocurrir con uh, el ejemplo que he dado en el nivel 1 de traducción. A pesar de llevar ya cuatro años en activo, la traducción de material pedagógico sigue siendo un gran desafío para nosotros. Por un lado, como he dicho al principio, hay lecciones que consideramos intraducibles cuando el método o el software no pueden usarse de ninguna forma con material cultural en español. Y por otro lado, no todos los métodos digitales ya existentes en inglés principalmente o que son uh, necesarios para las comunidades uh, de humanidades digitales, todos no están uh, disponibles en la versión inglesa de la revista. Es decir, algunos métodos no sirven directamente 
y hay métodos que sí necesitamos y que no están presentes en inglés. Y paso la palabra arriba. Hola, buenos días o buenas tardes. Um, por las razones que acaba de comentar Jennifer, desde muy temprano en el proyecto hemos tratado de adoptar estrategias que nos permitan recibir lecciones que, que hayan sido escritas, eh, teniendo en primer lugar en, eh, en consideración a la audiencia hispanohablante. Y siempre obviamente teniendo en cuenta el carácter global que tiene este proyecto. Una de las principales fuentes de recepción de tutoriales en español ha sido el grupo de humanistas digitales que se congregaron en agosto de 2018 en un taller de escritura que se llevó a cabo en Bogotá, Colombia. Nuestros editores María José Afanador eh, Yach, José Antonio Motilla y Adam Krimbul eh, reunieron a 22 practicantes de humanidades digitales de países como Colombia, México, Cuba, Brasil, Perú, Argentina, Chile, Gran Bretaña, Canadá y Estados Unidos. El evento eh, contó con financiamiento de la Academia Británica y el apoyo de la universidad que nos recibió en Colombia, la Universidad de los Andes y la, univers la Universidad de Hertfordshire. El evento fue diseñado teniendo en mente eh, desafiar la noción de que las soluciones del norte global son necesariamente adecuadas para las necesidades de los académicos que trabajan en el sur global. Y la selección de participantes se basó eh, en las propuestas que, eh, de posibles tutoriales para Programming Historian, que abarcaron, por ejemplo, desde la interpretación de fotografías de aviones teledirigidos, hasta el diseño de flujos de trabajo de digitalización de bajo costo, o la interpretación, por ejemplo, de análisis de redes. De este taller surgió, por ejemplo, eh, la lección Análisis de Corpus con Voyant Tools, de Silvia Gutiérrez de la Torre, a pesar de que Voyant Tools es un recurso popular y que tiene eh, abundantes instrucciones en inglés disponibles de manera gratuita en inglés, el análisis de texto no es una tarea sencilla, sobre todo en español, y por eso Silvia preparó el proceso de aprendizaje desde el comienzo, esto es, desde la creación de un corpus en texto plano. Y a partir de ahí se explican varias operaciones realizadas automáticamente por el programa, como son, por ejemplo, la frecuencia, la simetría estadística y palabras diferenciadas, y ofrece actividades para que el usuario pueda explorar la herramienta mientras aprende. Este creemos que es un ejemplo claro de lecciones necesarias de la revista en español, y que en inglés pueden ser pasadas por alto porque el programa mismo ya contiene instrucciones disponibles. Otro claro ejemplo de la necesidad de contar con lecciones para el mundo hispanohablante es la lección Construir un repositorio de fuentes históricas con Omega Classic de Jairo Antonio Melo Flores. A pesar de que Programming Historian ya contaba con dos lecciones sobre Omeca, traducidas además al español, Jairo, Jairo profundizó en su uso para fines de investigación a partir del conocimiento que él tiene de repositorios en el contexto del, de la institución en la que él trabaja. Con la formación de la comunidad de Programming Historian en español, una comunidad de comunidades en humanidades digitales, hemos logrado formar recursos enfocados en las necesidades de los humanistas en diferentes contextos y siguiendo con nuestro compromiso de formar un proyecto diverso y global, pero con conciencia de las particularidades de las comunidades a las que estamos llegando. Muchas gracias, ahora voy a dar paso a la próxima presentación. Hi. Uh... Before I start, uh, I believe I have to choose a French in the interpretation because I'm going to speak in French. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Thank you. It's done. Thank you. Uh, donc, uh, uh, je suis Sofia Papastampo et uh, je vais vous présenter uh, le programming historian uh, en français. Uh, donc, uh, pour nous, uh, tout uh, presque a commencé, uh, disons, avec un, un, un tweet. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, un, un tweet uh, uh, qui propose, uh, est-ce que cela vous dit? Uh, est-ce que vous voulez qu'on le fasse? Uh, ça signifie cela. Um, which, uh, 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 un tweet qui a été, en fait, uh, uh, une réponse à, à un blog post uh, de Adam Cranbull. Um, if we can pass to the next slide, please. Um, donc, un blog post qui célébrait um, les 10 ans du uh, Programming Historian et disait, entre autres choses, uh, uh, je vais les lire en anglais, We have big plans for what might be next. The project continues to grow in exciting new directions. And we are even on the lookout for a new French language team to help us move bravely forth into our second decade. 
Donc, euh, nous avons lancé très spontanément un, un tweet en réponse à, 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 à cette à, à publication. C'est comme ça que à, à, le programme historien en français a, a été à, à mis en place progressivement. Donc, cette équipe a, a été formée à l'origine okay. en 2018. Tout cela se passe en 2018 par deux femmes. Donc, je tiens à le dire, au début, on était à deux femmes à avoir mis ça en place qui ont préparé l'essentiel de l'infrastructure pour la création du site francophone. Cela, bien sûr, a été fait en collaboration étroite avec le reste de l'équipe du Programming Historian et tout particulièrement l'équipe technique. Et je tiens à saluer le travail de Matthew Lincoln à l'époque qui avait mis en place l'infrastructure du site en français en collaboration avec le reste de l'équipe que Brandon a présenté tout à l'heure. Et bien sûr, nous avons profité à, à, pour cela à, de l'expérience de l'équipe hispanophone à, qui avait été la première équipe à, à rejoindre à, le programme historien, à, la, la première équipe non anglophone. Donc, à, sur la phase finale de ce travail préparatoire, avant que le site web ne soit prêt, nous avons été rejoints par un troisième membre François-Dominique Lahamé, un Québécois très dynamique, qui a fourni un nouvel élan à notre équipe. Donc, dans les deux ans qui ont suivi, comme vous pouvez, vous pouvez le voir dans les slides, dans la diapo, notre équipe a vu l'arrivée au total, je ne vais pas détailler, de deux nouveaux membres, mais aussi le départ de deux de ses anciens. Donc, il y a eu une période, les deux premières années, où, en gros, pour chaque membre qui arrivait, il y avait un membre qui partait. Donc, on a eu des effectifs plutôt réduits. Donc, le travail que nous avons accompli dans les deux premières années de notre vie a été fait par une équipe qui, à minima, comptait deux membres ou tout au plus quatre membres à la fois temporalité confondue. Euh, donc, en fait, ça, ce n'est pas une nouveauté dans la mesure où euh, l'équipe du programme historien, euh, toutes les équipes confondues, est constamment renouvelée euh, à la suite de départs et de nouvelles arrivées euh, de euh, rédacteurs et de rédactrices. Euh, cependant, euh, les mobilités à... Euh, euh, que nous avons observé dans l'équipe francophone jusqu'à l'heure actuelle, se distingue par la durée pas trop longue de l'appartenance des personnes concernées à notre équipe. Donc, vous pouvez le voir en jaune dans la diapositive. En fait, les, les, les membres de l'équipe francophone, les anciens membres, sont restés entre un ou deux ans maximum, alors que euh, la plupart des anciens membres euh, du programme historien euh, sont restés euh, entre trois et quatre membres, c'est euh, la grande majorité. Pourquoi? Uh, maybe we can see the next slide. Um, nous avons uh, formulé quelques hypothèses. Hein. Uh, nous ne pouvons pas uh, uh, comment dire, appuyer ces conclusions de manière à, à catégorique. Euh, donc, nous formulons quelques hypothèses que ces départs euh, sont bien sûr liés à des motifs personnels, ça compte toujours, je parle de, de celle de l'équipe francophone. Euh, ça peut être aussi des, des priorités de carrière, mais euh, aussi, euh, on peut bien sûr euh, parler euh, des contraintes d'un système, euh, d'un enseignement supérieur qui favorise la, la précarité pardon, des jeunes chercheurs en humanité numérique et en histoire numérique plus particulièrement, et qui euh, aussi un système qui a du mal à, à, à évaluer, à, à tenir compte des contributions euh, comme celles euh, qu'on fait dans les programmes historiens, donc la contribution dans des projets d'histoire numérique, ne sont pas euh, proprement évalués pour l'avancement des carrières. Et là, je pense qu'on touche tout de même à des problèmes qui on peut voir aussi ailleurs et dont on peut discuter peut-être à la fin. 
toutefois, malgré, à, 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 malgré à, à ces obstacles, à, nous avons à, mis le programme historien à, en français à, dynamiquement dans, dans le paysage et nous sommes en cours d'intégrer à l'heure actuelle, cette année-ci, cinq à, à, nouveaux rédacteurs et rédactrices à, dans notre équipe avec des profils mixtes et à, qui ont des situations professionnelles à, diverses. Euh, pour finir avec les membres de notre équipe, pour le moment, il s'agit de francophones qui sont soit natifs, soit d'adoption, on peut dire ça, et qui vivent essentiellement ou proviennent essentiellement de l'Europe et de l'Amérique du Nord, donc pour la plupart au Canada. À moyen terme, bien sûr, notre objectif est d'intégrer des membres qui proviennent des pays de la francophonie plus large, ce qui sera en accord avec la politique de diversité du programme historien et avec notre volonté aussi. Donc, pour présenter brièvement ce qu'on a fait pendant ces deux ans et avec qui on l'a fait, avec, parce qu'il y a eu aussi une communauté très dynamique, euh, entre avril 2019, euh, date à laquelle notre site web euh, en français a vu le jour, euh, jusqu'à la fin de, du mois de mars 2021, donc environ deux ans, nous avons publié euh, 15 euh, leçons euh, traduites et une leçon originale. originale. Donc, nous avons euh, un total euh, de 16 euh, publications, euh, 15 traductions, une leçon originale, notre toute première leçon originale euh, en français. Nous avons pu recruter pour préparer ce travail un ensemble de, de 12 évaluateurs et évaluatrices pour les traductions. Et je parle des de personnes qui sont externes à l'équipe. Nous avons joué ces rôles, les membres de l'équipe, mais nous avons eu beaucoup d'aide de la part d'une communauté, parce qu'on y voit l'existence d'une communauté. Nous avons pu compter sur 10 traducteurs. Uh, donc, uh, qui nous ont fourni uh, 10 uh, sur 15 uh, de nos uh, traductions uh, qui sont actuellement uh, en ligne. Et je tiens à dire, je vais y revenir, c'était uh, des, des offres spontanées. Uh, ils sont venus uh, nous offrir à ce travail. Donc, nous avons été agréablement surpris. Euh, on compte également parmi nos collaborateurs euh, des auteurs euh, qui ont euh, rédigé euh, notre première leçon originale et trois évaluateurs de cette leçon euh, originale. Et pour euh, finir, euh, nous avons euh, un petit stock même euh, des huit traductions euh, qui sont prêtes à, à être évaluées ou qui sont en cours d'évaluation pour être prochainement euh, publiées. Et euh, en total, à des cinq, nous avons reçu environ dans, dans six mois, euh, huit mois, euh, depuis le deuxième semestre de 2020 plus précisément, nous avons reçu un total de cinq propositions originales. Donc, euh, dans notre sens, euh, il est clair que euh, les contributions euh, spontanées ont beaucoup compté dans le développement euh, qu'on peut juger finalement euh, très rapide, euh, assez rapide du programme historien en, en français, euh, à ce point que euh, notre équipe, euh, qui ne comptait pas beaucoup de membres, comme vous l'avez vu dans les deux premières années de son existence, a été rattrapée par cette offre. Et nous avons eu aussi des, des, des retards considérables à traiter à, à, finalement à, toutes ces traductions et à, à, nous courons pratiquement à, derrière à les propositions qui nous tombent ces derniers temps. Euh, aussi, nous n'avons pas rencontré de difficultés particulières pour trouver à, des évaluateurs et des évaluatrices, que ce soit pour les traductions à, ou pour à, à, la, la seule raison originale que nous avons à, évaluée pour à, le moment. Donc, <coughs> cette offre à, qui vient de la communauté, témoigne pour nous, d'une part, de la vivacité de la communauté des humanités numériques francophones et d'autre part, cela montre aussi que le programme historien en français, pour moi, le reste du programme historien, a rempli un besoin particulier. Il y a une demande pour ce que le programme historien offre. Et je pense qu'il y a Daniel Alves par la suite qui va en parler à, à, encore par rapport à, à ce sujet. Donc, à, je vais lui laisser les paroles. Je vais finir à, à, concernant la publication à, francophone. 
Euh, donc, nous sommes très optimistes parce que nous pensons y avoir euh, des éléments moteurs euh, qui font que euh, le programme historien en français est en train de, de revenir en lieu de rassemblement euh, des forces vives à euh, l'humanité numérique euh, francophone. Euh, donc, à, à titre de conclusion, euh, je serais tentée de dire qu'au euh, bout de quelques deux ans d'existence euh, du programme historien euh, en français, euh, nous avons même travaillé au-dessus de nos capacités et euh, en cela, nous avons été à, par beaucoup à, à portés par cette communauté à, à très vive à, avec laquelle on va bien sûr continuer à travailler. Je vous remercie et je laisse la parole à Daniel Alves. Merci beaucoup, Sophie. Thank you uh, for the organizers of the Global Symposium for the presentation. And thank you for um, the presentation of all my colleagues in the programming historian. Um, I'm going to talk here uh, a little bit about the history of, uh, well, from, from, from history, my background is from history. So uh, from the, the history of the, how we build the, Portuguese team um, and how we are planning to use the uh, educational resources that uh, programming historian offered online uh, in our digital humanities courses uh, in, in Portugal and Brazil. For now, we have uh, collaborations from Portugal, Portugal and Brazil in this uh, version of the uh, programming historian in Portuguese. Uh, well, it's in Portuguese, but I'm going to speak uh, in English. Uh, so sorry for the colleagues, uh, uh, Brazilian and Portuguese colleagues that are out there. Um, so uh, Jennifer, please, uh, the next slide. Thank you. Um, well, the, the, the collaboration with Programming Historian uh, uh, occurs from a need to develop and sustain um, a digital literacy curricula across the humanities in, in both countries. Uh, despite the, the development of the digital humanities community uh, since 2013 uh, at a, a faster pace because we have um, um, a, um, an association of digital humanities of the Portuguese uh, speaking community in 2013. Then we have several uh, congresses in 2015 in Portugal and in 2018. And at this present uh, a specific moment, uh, we are inaugurating the uh, second uh, Congress on Digital Humanities in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, it's happening right now. Uh, but this uh, development on digital humanities has been more evident in, uh, in the research field. Uh, there is little attention uh, regarding the education or uh, teaching or producing teaching materials in Portuguese for our courses. Of course, some subjects, uh, some isolated subjects or were already introduced it in several disciplines in linguistics, history, literature, uh, art history, for instance. Uh, but at, at the moment, there are no undergraduate, master or doctorate degree specifically in digital humanities in Portuguese, uh, in Brazil and in Portugal. There are some experience uh, isolated and some new proposals, uh, but uh, we do need to make uh, uh, a bigger effort uh, to teach uh, digital humanities in our humanities courses. Next slide. Um, it was in this context that the programming historian uh, uh, was seen as an opportunity so we can develop this, uh, um, uh, this perspective in the uh, uh, digital humanities uh, that speak Portuguese. Uh, in this context, uh, programming historian uh, was thought about as a good uh, auxiliary tool 
for teaching the digital humanities. In Portugal and Brazil, there are several colleagues, uh, mine included, but some of the colleagues that are at the present time in the uh, Portuguese version of the uh, programming historian that uh, already since 2080 uh, started to uh, incorporate some of the tools, uh, specifically Python, uh, in their uh, courses. Um, in the case of uh, uh, Universidade Nova de Lisboa, which is my university in Portugal, uh, I teach the course Informatics Applied to History. Uh, and in there, I've incorporated some classes about Python to analyze and collect information on historical sources. And it's been on the curricula since 2012. And next slide, please. Um, with that in mind and seeing that the community was already using the programming historian uh, in, in English and uh, then the uh, Spanish and French uh, editions, uh, in a Twitter uh, exchange with the programming historian team in 2018, uh, we made a, a question if it was possible to start to build a Portuguese version. Uh, the programming story team was very enthusiastic with the, with the idea. Um, and then we start uh, uh, put together uh, a team uh, with Ricardo Pimenta from IBICT, uh, with Jimmy Medeiros and other colleagues from Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Brazil, also with Luis Ferla and other colleagues from Unifest. Um, Bruno Martins from uh, Instituto uh, Superior Técnico in Portugal, and uh, myself and other colleagues from uh, the uh, Digital Humanities Lab in Nova uh, FCSH. Uh, in 2020, this uh, initial team grew uh, to more than 20 volunteers that were able to translate all the platform. Um, and the first lesson uh, of the programming historian in Portuguese, which was published uh, in January uh, 2021. Uh, starting March this, this year, uh, we secured a grant from Fundação Getúlio Vargas to help us um, to uh, translate uh, more lessons and to make a study on digital literacy among uh, and the graduate and graduate students in social sciences and humanities using uh, the lessons uh, of the programming historian that we are going to translate. The next slide, please. Um, and of course, uh, translating uh, lessons from uh, English, uh, as was mentioned by the uh, colleagues from the Spanish team and the French team is a challenge. Um, of course, it's, uh, because we are not dealing with uh, only one version of, of uh, uh, the Portuguese. Um, in a simplified uh, manner, we can present uh, the several uh, traditions of Portuguese as branches uh, on the GitHub then that we have to work to merge in one uh, file, one final translation. Uh, for now, we are only dealing with the Portuguese in, in Portugal, the European Portuguese, if we can say that, and the Brazilian uh, branch of the, of the Portuguese. Uh, but of course, in the future, uh, we would like to incorporate colleagues from Africa and from Asia, uh, because also there, there are several countries that use the Portuguese as main language. But for now, the, the effort is to bring together Brazil and Atlantic and to merge these differences in the way we speak Portuguese from both sides of the Atlantic. Um, this is a challenge, but also uh, some fun <laughs> a task. Uh, because in the process we are discovering uh, much more about the culture of both countries, about the, the tradition of the language, how it evolved, 
how it differentiates between Portugal and, uh, and Brazil. In, in Portugal, we have a much more formal way of speaking and in Brazil, it's a more colloquial way of speaking. So we try to uh, merge these two branches. Uh, the platform and the lessons are translated by one Portuguese and one Brazilian colleague following a control glossary and a set of rules to deal with subtle differences among the, uh, uh, the language. For instance, I bring here three examples. Uh, the word file uh, is translated in the Portuguese from Portugal as ficheiro uh, and in uh, the Brazilian uh, version of Portuguese is translated as arquivo. Well, arquivo in Portugal also means uh, historical archive. It's, it's a translation for historical archive. So we use the ficheiro as the translation for file. As for researcher, um, we choose the Brazilian version, pesquisador, since investigador, which is the Portuguese version, in Brazil means a policeman which investigates crime. So it was uh, uh, probably awkward for us to use investigador in the translation. So we, we choose uh, pesquisador. And in uh, other uh, times, the differences are only in one, uh, one small letter, for instance, translation of team uh, in Portuguese from Portugal is equipa uh, and in Portuguese from Brazil it's equipe and we choose the Brazilian version uh, in this case. Uh, the final slide. So uh, in overcoming this uh, language uh, barrier because we know that most of the uh, programming languages, most of the software, most of the technical terms are in English. Uh, and that makes it more difficult to uh, produce uh, teaching materials, to introduce uh, in, the, um, in our courses, uh, digital humanities. Uh, we've thought about uh, this translation effort that we are incorporating in the programming historian as a way for us to to help to facilitate uh, a digital transformation in the teaching of digital humanities in portugal uh, and brazil of course we are making a very small step uh, but it's a step uh, to overcome uh, the language barrier in the use of the technologies and to try to develop uh, more uh, a critical view on the objects, methods, and digital resources without the need of us to uh, concern with the translation of concepts and the instructions that uh, the other two teams already mentioned. Uh, so it's a uh, first step. We started on January. We only have one lesson translated. We have uh, six lessons, five or six lessons uh, already being translated and reviewing, and we uh, hope to uh, make uh, more contributions along this year for the programming historian. So thank you for your attention. All right, thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you for putting together the the conference and of course to, to all the, the people um, that are in the programming historian. So one of the 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 things that that I'm going to talk about, I'm the one of the newest sort of members of the programming historian. What what that means is that I'm probably the most uh, the closest to understanding just how large of an infrastructure uh, this is and, and the, the sort of global implications of that infrastructure. Um, so I've been working with the programming historian at some point, or at least been aware of it from very uh, close to the beginning. I've written articles on it, uh, but being an editor just gave me sort of a vastly new understanding of, um, you know, kind of what we do. So um, 
sorry, next slide. So one of the things that we talked a lot about is, uh, yeah, <laughs> one of the things that we uh, talked about is just sort of our technical infrastructure. So this is kind of a, a joking comic about XKC, uh, from XKCD, uh, which, you know, talks about what Git is and what GitHub is. So if you're not familiar, um, you know, maybe a lot of people in digital humanities probably are familiar, uh, but it can be extremely complex. It, it was originally designed as a way to uh, manage um, development in the Linux kernel. And as, as, after that, um, it's sort of become uh, a norm for software development in general. Um, and so we're using sort of a, a platform that's not necessarily designed to really host a journal. Uh, we're using a, a platform that's designed to code software, uh, which makes it uh, very difficult to get uh, both new editors, but um, you know, especially writers kind of familiar because along with kind of uh, making sure that everyone is aware or, or everyone sort of writes the lesson or, or kind of contributes in that regard, they also kind of have to know a little bit of this infrastructure. Um, so, uh, sorry, next slide. Along with that infrastructure, we also have these kind of issues like uh, this is an email I got around 4.50 a.m. <laughs> one time. Uh, I probably sh uh, should have asked Adam if I could share this, but uh, you know, I, there was some sort of pro uh, one of the things with uh, GitHub uh, is that there can be a lot of just sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, there's a lot of sort of backlog that can uh, accumulate uh, due to the fact that we're all in, in different areas of the world. Um, so, you know, sometimes at 4.50 a.m., I could be holding up uh, our whole team uh, without necessarily knowing that. And, and, you know, a lot of us are in the North American region or at least in the European region, but for many people that are in, in sort of time zones where it's nighttime, uh, and stuff like that during the the times that most of um, us are working, um, you know, issues like this are kind of probably vastly worse than than they are for me. Um, so next slide. <laughs> the um, uh, the other. Uh, kind of uh, thing is that we, we've we developed this infrastructure, not just as, as Brandon talked about as a, as a way to uh, just uh, do the peer review process, which I'll, which I'll kind of briefly get into, uh, but also to run the website itself. So somebody that's involved in this is kind of uh, also seeing our infrastructure bare, right? So they can see how we've created the site, uh, but at the same time, we're again, we're, we're running into that problem where that same infrastructure is the way that we're peer reviewing our journals and our editors are expected to um, know how to kind of grapple with that. Um, uh, next slide. So uh, we have two actual repositories. So this is, uh, sorry, I, I kind of forgot that I had this slide. We, we have two repositories. We have our actual website repository and then our submissions repository. And, and just kind of going in between those two can be very complex for people. Um, so we have, as, as you can see, we have, for those of you who are familiar with GitHub, we have 67 branches just in our submissions and about 178 uh, at the time of this screenshot in our um, actual website. And, and we kind of move between those and, and oftentimes are uh, both sort of editors, but also uh, people that want us to reach out to us uh, don't know which one of these to use and stuff like that. So we're constantly working with this to make it more easier. And the language issue just kind of works, uh, you know, just sort of exacerbates this even more. Um, next slide. We've had uh, difficulty finding writers as a result of this. Um, we've gotten, uh, in the past, uh, we've solicited people uh, to write for us, um, but in, in most cases, people reach out to us. So it, it often takes a person that already has a significant technical background. Uh, one, they're writing, uh, you know, a journal or, or a lesson for uh, us that, you know, involves some sort of technical thing. Um, but the fact that they also need to um, sort of learn all this infrastructure and the fact that um, come up with these ideas and, and all that kind of stuff, just like you would in a regular, uh, you know, regular journal, uh, quote unquote, um, makes it very difficult to us to, to get writers. So a, a lot of times in the past or a few times in the past, we've had uh, people, uh, you know, we've, we've kind of given out these calls, like if, if anyone's interested in writing one of these, uh, please reach out to us. But we don't necessarily get the same uh, reaction. Most of the people that that um, 
uh, in the in the sort of global DH community, uh, most of the people that um, respond had to speak the English language, and and they they write with that um, uh, with the idiosyncratic uh, idiosyncratic nature of that language. Right. Um, next. Uh, so we are an open peer review uh, journal, um, and that also uh, deals with some cultural issues that we've come into. A lot of people are in a position where this open peer review process is very difficult for them. Um, so this is both sort of a, 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 a FYI, uh, but um, you know, a real problem. We do allow people to uh, send their stuff in closed peer review. From what I remember, I don't really, I definitely wasn't involved in any of these. Uh, so uh, some of the people that are uh, been in the programming historian a little bit longer um, uh, might be able to talk about this, but uh, we the open peer review process is very um, culturally ingrained uh, and, and, you know, deals with some of the the power structures that we have uh, internationally, right? So uh, certain universities and some faculty members, uh, you know, feel more comfortable kind of doing an open peer review. Uh, and then many people, uh, you know, are very uncomfortable. And, and that, uh, you know, it's not just a, an issue of um, nationalistic or, uh, you know, cultural issues. There's also a lot of identity issues, as you might imagine, where, um, you know, certain people uh, are more based on on their self identifications or, or people's perceived uh, identifications of them uh, more comfortable with with kind of putting out this this work uh, in an open peer review process. Um, next slide. Um, so in the in the past, uh, you know, what we've done is we've started trying to mitigate um, many of these issues. Uh, we've developed, and, and the programming historian when I joined, uh, had developed a large deal of uh, guidelines. So we have uh, editor guidelines, we have author guidelines, translator guidelines, technical contributions, uh, reporting a bug. Um, so anybody can actually see uh, in, in sort of the, the motto that we have to kind of keep everything open. You can see sort of our onboarding process uh, and what that looks like. So if you're ever, um, you know, want to get sort of a, a larger uh, detailed analysis of this, you're, you're more than welcome to, to see some of these guidelines. Um, but what you'll see is that we have not we, we not only have uh, issues about how the community um, should, inter or how we should uh, interact with the community, so issues of sort of ethics and stuff like that. Uh, we also have issues of uh, technical infrastructure and all the editors are required uh, when we join to, to uh, contribute in some regard, uh, because that's really how we're going to be able to work with our authors and the people that are um, you know, providing us many of these lessons um, is through this sort of technical infrastructure. Um, so I, I do encourage you to to kind of take a glance at that from uh, for audience. Oh, uh, I, I do in, encourage anybody that wants to take a glance at that to, to kind of, uh, you know, go ahead and do that because um, you'll see that uh, while you know, the relationship between editor and journal, and we, we kind of want to publish this as a journal, right? Uh, and we're in the, again, the um, uh, directory of open access journals. Uh, you know, people, uh, when you put that on your CV, a lot of people are thinking a vastly different um, skill set that you're bringing. And again, that, that can uh, deal with issues of, of um, nationality and global uh, globalization, right, where uh, certain people are provided credit uh, for uh, much of this work increasingly in uh, the United States. Um, but as you heard from some of my previous colleagues, there's not that sort of robust digital humanities infrastructure. So many people are not getting credit for the, the sort of um, technical work that they're doing along with their editorial work and in, in sort of a more uh, you know, traditional journal where, where you kind of edit some things and, and reach out to reviewers and stuff like that. 
Uh, the other thing we've we've put together is a shadowing process. So we, we've we've started to get to the point where even these editorial guidelines uh, can get pretty complex. So we've developed a shadow process, and that deals with um, normally we're in editor um, sort of editorial groups based on language, um, but it's very hard, I think, at, at the same time to kind of contribute to to multiple language. So really, the the people that uh, might benefit from uh, you know, they have sort of a bilingual uh, background and, and they're able to kind of translate freely. Um, they don't necessarily at the current time, right, have uh, the same sort of overlap that I think that in the future we'd like to we'd like to sort of have. Um, and the last thing is that a lot of this just takes time. I mean, we, you see up there that we have um, a report a bug feature. Now that, that's sort of a, a thing you would find on most websites, but that's actually something we do as editors. We also try to deal with bugs. Um, now we won't, uh, you know, diagnose your computer or anything like that, but there's a lot of people that reach out to us. So uh, just the other day, I had to install a variety of software um, just to kind of deal with a bug based on the operating system the the uh, person had and all that kind of stuff. And we, many people in the, um, you know, even small stuff like that were um, in the United States, many humanity scholars are using things like Max or um, so on and, and so forth. And whereas a lot of people in, um, in sort of the global south oftentimes are on Windows or uh, Linux computers. Um, and so we, we're running into that issue as well. So you can see that this kind of large technical infrastructure makes it really difficult for us to kind of have this uh, global uh, phenomenon. So it's not just uh, the issue of translation. There's also all this kind of technical issue that a new editor would have to kind of um, join. I mean, we try to make that as, as easy as possible, but I think it would be uh, disingenuous to say it's it's uh, as easy as it could be right now. Um, so this is something we're, we're constantly working on. Um, so I'll, I'll end it there uh, because I know that we're running a little bit behind on time and we have one, uh, one other person. So uh, thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak to, with you and I'd be happy to take any questions anyone has during our Q&A session. Hello, I'm Jessica Parr. Um, I am the global team lead, um, and I'm going to talk about the ways that the global team helps to support some of the other work that our language teams um, are working on, as well as trying to help make the programming historian speak to a global audience as a whole. Next slide, please. I'm going to start with a map of our team members, the editors. Um, as you can see, we have the Spanish team in red, the English team in blue, the Portuguese team in green, and the French team in purple. Um, what we like to see with our language teams um, and the presentation by Daniel kind of showed why is to have our different language teams come from different sociolinguistic backgrounds um, because Portuguese in Brazil is not Portuguese in Portugal. French in Canada is not necessarily French in Switzerland. Um, so global team helps to support looking at some of these balances in the different language teams because we're usually the first line of contact as new teams come are proposed and come on board. Um, and then the process is that once they, we make contact with them and talk them through the process and see on both sides if it's a good fit, we'll then bring in the managing editor and other members of team and go through the process um, of what Nabil mentioned of bringing them on board. Next slide, please. Um, you can see just quickly a list of our lang uh, members of our language team divided by English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese. Um, you can find this on our homepage. Um, but as you can see now, we are up to about 29 different editors across the four languages. Um, fairly robust right now, but what we are looking at um, in a number of languages is to expand our work into other parts of the world, particularly the global south. Um, the French team 
is looking to expand its initiatives in um, in Africa, in French-speaking West Africa. Daniel mentioned that they would like to bring on some editors or other team members from Africa who speak um, Portuguese from an African perspective. English language team has talked about working with folks from Africa who are primarily English. Um, traditionally, the way that we have done this is to start with some um, workshops along the lines of what Riva mentioned in her, her presentation. Um, Riva and Adam ran the uh, workshop a few years ago in Bogota, Colombia, that was intended to attract Spanish speakers from a number of different countries in, in South and Latin America um, in order to both to learn some of the tools and then the guideline was for them to eventually hopefully write what would become a peer reviewed publication for us that originated in Spanish. Um, the Portuguese team is working on some of that in both basis of the grant. Um, French team has also been working on grant initiatives to do that as well. But of course, the global pandemic has slowed down our ability to hold workshops on the ground. Um, and we hope as the these things subside as conditions improve and the epidemic is under control that we can start to uh, bring some of these programs up again. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one of the other initiatives that we help to support in addition to grant writing and helping to develop workshops and, and trying to edit, identify new teams to come on board, new language teams to come on board, is to look at ways to better facilitate the, the work between our teams. Um, so to make sure that our language teams are not siloed, at least excessively, so that you know the English team is not in their own silo and the Spanish team is not in their own silo, the French team is not in their own silo. Um, and we've talked about trying to both to document some of the processes that Daniel has mentioned with trying to navigate between Portuguese um, in Brazil and Portuguese in Portugal, because we want to, uh, we expect this problem to come up again and again as we grow. Um, and having some documentation about how we resolve these issues, we think will be able to help us to work out problem solving better in the future. Um, and when, one of the ways that we have documented some of the work that we have done, other than per, uh, publications ourselves, has been through our blog. You'll notice here I have a screenshot of um, a blog written by Riva Quiroga and Jennifer Isaisi um, about the, their process of equipping editorial team for programming historian in Spanish. Um, just below from January was the blog that Daniel Alves and uh, Jennifer Isaisi uh, wrote about documenting the launch of our Portuguese team in early in January. Um, and this is some of the, the continued work we'll do, um, as well as looking at trying to help streamline the process of onboarding and training new editors. Um, one of the, the so um, Nabil mentioned the need to have um, editor, have shadowing editors. So we'd have people uh, follow the new, new uh, possible new team members, follow the editors, learn the process of our GitHub repo, learn our editorial procedures, learn our technical procedures, um, which as Nabil and Brandon mentioned is not a small light or necessarily easy process for all. Um, but what we would like to do because that does place a very heavy burden on our editors for efficiency to find new ways to maybe centralize some of that training so that we're not putting as much strain on individual editors and also to facilitate um, more multilingual training across the GitHub to help improve the siloed nature across the different teams. Um, next slide, please. Um, 
Yes, and uh, Riva has posted an open call for Spanish editors. Um, so if you are among, uh, if you are a Spanish language DHR, please check us out. Um, so finally, uh, what global uh, the global team does is overall try to support the program historians' goals of having an academic journal that speaks across linguistic and academic cultures to provide open access pedagogical resources that translate globally and to help uh, build up a community of communities. So not just members who are currently on the team of the programming historian, but members of the global DH community to work with us together um, to help make this a, a true partnership across the world. Thank you.